Um, hello to Incon Paris. Uh, thank you for being here and thank you for having us. Okay. Um, we, are, um, we are about to have a session on the, the striptease of the, Andro the Android permission system. And the session is highly focused on Marshmallow, even if we will uh, so speak about Lollipop a little bit too. Okay. Oops. Yes. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'm Alize, I'm um, a system, uh, I'm a Linux and Android system developer, and I'm actually working on the, the well known emulator of Genimotion. I'm Alexis Rosowski, I am an Android platform developer, and I work at Genimobile 2 on the Genimaster project, which is basically a ROM customization for client needs, and it's very cool. Okay, so we will start with an overview from the perspective of an apps developer about permission. Then we need to look at some prerequisites uh, regarding Linux permission system to better understand Android permissions. In part four, we're going into the internals, and at the end, finally, we'll show up some fun stuff we find out during our, our investigations. So about the overview from the app developer, uh, perspective. So you already know that a permission is defined as a string in uh, Android. Its uh, permissions are part of the security platform. And another point of the security platform is the apps unboxing. It, each app gets its dedicated process. So now, more from a user point of view, how do we see those permissions? In uh, Lollipop, permissions are granted are prompted at install time. And uh, you can see the system displays it for you as groups. Those groups are uh, unfoldable. You can see the detail of each permission. And this UI is prompted from uh, Google Play, as you can see in the screenshot. Now in Marshmallow, the behavior depends on the target SDK uh, of the application. So when you're targeting the Marshmallow uh, SDK, uh, aka level 23, and requesting a dangerous permission, uh, the system actually prompts you for the permission group. So you can see the installation of the app, which doesn't show any kind of permission at all. This is a runtime test, and you can see the, the group request and granted. Uh, the UI is obviously from the system. This is not a Google Play or installer UI. The permission itself is never displayed, it's only hide, hidden behind the, the group. Uh, on the other hand, for an uh, application with a target SDK lesser than 23, the, uh, the installation uh, permission, the ins uh, sorry, the permissions are presented at install time, also as a group, because they are uh, grouped under the storage icon. And you can also see I get the read permission even though I only requested the write permission. Okay, uh, so uh, as we said, that's when you're uh, installing an application uh, under Lollipop, we saw groups. The groups, uh, what, what's of these groups is permission groups. It's a set of permission, and you can declare a permission group, a custom one, in your uh, Android manifest. So this is how it's, uh, it's done. So these are the, the mandatory attributes. And what you should know is this priority attribute is, compl is completely optional. For the moment, not the system, even Marshmallow is using this attribute. Maybe sooner or later. Um, next, when you declare your own permission, you need to declare like uh, in this way. Uh, all, the, um, all the attributes are mandatory except the permission group because you are able to declare a permission outside of a group, of course. And you can uh, also uh, don't need to, ref to refer the protection level, but the default, uh, it will be set to default, and the default one will be the lowest uh, protection level. And in order to use your permission, we you, you need to use a specific tag in your manifest is user's permission or user's permission SDK 23. So we need to talk about the protection level because it's the main key here. You have three different uh, levels, normal, dangerous, and signature. Normal, do not request anything from the user. 
as a signature because they are uh, a grant and the insult time. And dangerous is the, the very one which is new uh, uh, regarding the behavior. About signature permission, we can apply some, uh, some flags that we are able to gain some features regarding uh, some features like privilege or developments. Uh, so what is done in the framework is that only dangerous permissions are gathered in groups. The other permissions is outside of group. And, danger, and the dangerous uh, permission are granted at the runtime in Marshmallow. Okay, so now regarding the application sandboxing. Uh, on a regular PC running Linux, for example, one human is associated to a user, which is itself associated to a session. On a Linux computer, you, uh, the user is defined with a numeric ID called UID for unique identifier. It also gets a string, a string representation. And on the other hand, uh, well, Android is Linux based and it also uses this concept of UID. But Linux uses it to defer and to se separate its, its users. And Android only uses it to uh, separate each of its application. Each application gets uh, its very own UID, its unique ID. So in this extract, you can see a list of processes uh, which are actually application process. And on the right um, side, we have the package name, so it's quite clear that each line is an application. On the left side, you get the UID, which is this time not in numeric representation, it's in string representation. <coughs> so we can very well see that each UID is different for all applications. And we can guess that is, uh, there is a multi-user in play there, because we see the U0 something, which means user owner, the natural owner of the, uh, the natural user of the Android device. And we will explain this later on. So we need to talk about the Linux permission to better understand what happened in Android. So what happened in Linux? Linux, you have a user which is defined with a numerical uh, ID. Uh, this user, there's a particular user on the, on the Linux which is root. It have the numerical ID zero and have a lot of privilege in your, in your Linux system. Each file and process are strongly attached to users. And the users must belong to one group. And this group is called a primary group. So a group, like the user, have a numerical ID, right? And a group can contain uh, no users as many. But that's not uh, to uh, be able to access files and directories on the, on the Linux. There's three permission entities, the owner, the group, and the rest of the world. For example, here in our example, you will see that the directory lollipop belongs to the, to, to the users Arozov and, and to the group users. In our case, Arozov is, belongs also to the group users. But to do things in this directory, you need to have rights to do it. And the rights are defined here in letters. And these rights are write, read, write, and execution. So the first, the first three sets of letters here are for the user's rights. The three next letters are for the, are for the group uh, rights. And the three last letters define the rights for the rest of the world. So for an example, in the, fir on the first line for the lollipop directory, you can see that Arozov can do everything he wants, and the users are able to read and execute as the rest of the, of the, of the users of the system. But in the second line, you can see that Arozov is able to do everything but the rest of the world, including the, including the root group, those users belonging to the root group, are unable to do anything there. So, a gradient process, a process is what? It's a file who has the, the possibility to be executed. And the rights for the process will depend on who is going to start the process. So, um, this, the, the process will have the same right as the user who launched it. So see have here the user and each process also have an ID called PID we can see here. Okay, so now on the Android side. 
um, the users are still users, of course, and the, the, the UID definition is quite similar, actually, because UID zero is still the super user, the, the root user. Uh, there are a few of the reserved UIDs, just like 1000, which is the system user, a very particular user in uh, Android. And um, the UIDs uh, over 10,000 are reserved for application and are distributed along installations. So the first one should be 10,000 exactly, 10,001 maybe, and then going on. Uh, the GID is naturally the same value as UID in Android. It's their convention. Um, you can see an extract of the file data system packages that lists uh, just down there, I guess it's not really readable, but uh, the idea is this file contains a lot of information, starting with the package name, identifying an application. Then you got the numerical value of the UID. The first one is the, the calendar app with a new ID over 10,000. And a few groups that are listed at the end of the line. Those are going to be applied on the process running the calendar app. On the second line, they get the phone app, and the phone app has a UID which is a bit specific because it's 1001. Uh, it's a reserved UID. There's also a few groups at the end. So about the um, system reserved UIDs, you can see here that the 1001 UID, called in this place AID for Android ID, basically the same notion with another name, is dedicated to phone operation, the AID radio. There's a lot of um, defined UID, reserved UID in Android. This is just an extract. Uh, now, uh, we can see this a behavior very similar to what happened on Linux on files. So this is the files of uh, the calendar application. Uh, as you can see, there are still the read-write permissions for the owner, group, and the rest of the world. We can see the UID and GID of this app in string representation this time, U0823. And that's pretty much it. A little tricks, when you're doing testing, developing, uh, running shell, you usually get the user shell. It's also a user defined <coughs> in Android. When you want to test something in shell using an app UID, you can use the run as command specifying a package name, and it will automatically fetch and use the UID of this package name. Now, Android uh, also uses its uh, system-defined user to apply rights on files, more specifically its own device tree. We can see here an extract of C code. Uh, the location kind of depends on the Android version we're using. We just referenced uh, Lollipop and Marshmallow here. And we can see exactly the same kind of information. For the right uh, 00770, which is actually read, write, execution rights for the three categories we have, just represented in octal form. Then the UID, AID system in for the first line. Then the GID, AID cage. And under this, we can see that LS actually shows us on a device at runtime, those permissions are correctly applied. The system does this on boot up. And now one of the, few of the few things we can do with UIDs as an application developer is use the shared UID attributes in the manifest tag. So this actually allows us uh, to use the same UID on several applications. It has a few, a few implications. It allows us to uh, share permissions between packages. And the permission state is propagated to all packages. That means if two applications, uh, yeah, if two applications want to use the same permission, if only one need to get it granted. Same thing the other way around with revocation. On top of this, if you're using shared UID, you can also run two applications in the server in the same process. But that's another story. Okay, so now let's see what's happened in the permission in the app's lifetime. Okay, so when you are trying to install an, app, uh, an IPK on your system, is a package manager who, is, who is, um, is triggered, and what's the first thing he's going to do is to parse the, uh, the Android manifest XML. He will retrieve the information about your permission, and we store this information in two different uh, files, 
in data system packages uh, dot list and packages X, uh, dot XML. The rest of the process is uh, delegated to a native daemon called installd. So as we said, all the permission, uh, normal permission and signed permission are granted on the install, and that's true here in Marshmallow. And for all the other version of Android, that's true for all the, t for all the permissions. But what is important here is that for any users of your device, this permission will be granted for all the users. Now we need to talk about the process, because I don't know if you know, when you try to launch an application, uh, the framework, the framework is triggered and will, will uh, call a native daemon called zygot, uh, which zygot is running as root. So how from the root, uh, from a root process, we're going to be able to get uh, an, our apps running in its own uh, process with different UID is because zygot is able to, ch to set and change the UID and the GIDs. So what was a very simple part? Okay. As I said at the beginning, I said that users can belong to a group, a primary group, but also belongs to other kind of groups you can add to it. It's as we call secondary group. And when you, are you, um, you belong to other groups, you can gain some privilege. Is that the way we gain privilege under Linux and under Android? And what we call in Android is GID mapping, and this is how it works. So it's happened during the, all the time of the lifetime of the device. What happened is when you're starting your, your device, when you boot in it, the package manager service is going to read a very specific file here in system etc permission platform.xml. In, um, in, um, in this file, you have for given permission uh, some ma uh, matching GIDs. I will take an example, like for example, you have like internet permission, have his own GID. So what's happened when you're selling an application from Google Play or IDB? Of course, again, it's going to pass the XML. You find out that you're using the internet permission and we store the information in the package XML, uh, packages.xml. But when you're clicking on the, uh, on the icon uh, to launch your application, the activity managed service needs the affirmation to give it to Zygot. So what is going on is that Activity Manager Service is requesting to the Package Manager Service to retrieve this information about this, the GIDs. So the primary GID and the secondary GIDs in order to get all the features around the internet permission. And it gives it back to Zygot. Zygot have it and is able to set up the UID and GIDs with uh, system calls. And then your activity is launched. Now about the runtime permissions. Uh, runtime permissions are dangerous permissions. They are revocable even for pre-Marshmallow apps, even though their behavior might be quite undefined. And those are unique per user, meaning they are actually affected to a UID, as in the UIDs we uh, spoke about before, and not a user session. Um, and revocation kills kitten. Actually, the revocation process kind of implies uh, the death of uh, related applications. So about uh, permission denial, which is quite close, I have quite a long GIF showing a little scenario. So let's try to follow this. The idea is to deny an external <coughs> storage permission. So danger was prompted at one time. Okay. Where am I? I think it was in the big That's the end. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to require a um, right external storage. I'm going to get a runtime prompt. Runtime prompt. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm going to deny it. So when I ask it again, so of course the right fail. When I ask it again, I get the never ask again box. If I check this box, I cannot allow the permission. So I'm going to check it and deny it. Now, if I click on the button, I don't get a runtime prompt and my write fails. My only way to get out of this is to get back to the, system, to the application settings, specifically the permission, and then enable it manually. If I get back in my app, I can write external storage and stuff gets written. 
So this implies persistence. The framework does know if we get this, if we have this permission right now or not, if it's the first time or not. We're going to see a little bit more on this just now. So at runtime, same use case. My user application is going to call get external trajectory. This ends up in the mount service. The mount service is going to check policies. In this case, policies is just a local abstraction from the mount service because in the, in the end, it is going to check permission to the package manager service and to the app op service. It's not exactly a permission. It is going to check the underlying operation for this permission. Basically, it's going to ask the package manager service to say something like, oh boy, do you have this in your manifest? And then the app app service to get the status of, is the, is the user already prompted for this? Does it say, did it say hello or deny? What's the status? And then it is going to dump its result in the data system app op XML file, which mainly represents the states of a runtime permission. Now, there is something missing in the schematics. It would be the UI part. Actually, this is done every time you use an API call that requires a runtime permission. And the UI would insert itself just when you check the permission to the package manager service. And by an intent exchanged with another package called the package installer, which is part of the platform, this is the package that's, that's going to show this UI. So there is a little bit of exchange on top of it, but this is the system part. This is what, what gets the job done. Now, what did we see just there? We see that from the inside, actually the platform kind of segments its own permissions into two kinds, the install time and the runtime. Regarding install time, all normal permissions and signature permissions get granted at install. They do that for all users, as in all human, all user sessions, all human using the device. The persistence is managed by the packet manager service, and we got the file where, where it is actually stored. Regarding the runtime permissions, uh, those are the dangerous permission. Those are granted per user, so an application installed for two users might not have the, main, the same permission state, depending on the user. And the persistence is managed by the app op service with the file data system app ops XML. Basically, Lollipop tends to get the um, install time uh, procedure. So by covering Marshmallow permissions, we kind of cover uh, Lollipop permissions too. And now a few of the curiosities we found out while uh, exploring this. Um, unexpected behavior is for headless applications. While you, when you write an application that only contains a service and that does not require UI, you don't have any facilities at all to request permission. You actually need an activity. Either put it in your package directly and call your activity, or use the shared user ID mechanism for sharing permission to rely on another app to ask your permission for you. But you really need an activity. You can't get no permission, no dangerous permission without any UI at all. Uh, another additive would be the dedicated uh, error log file for the package manager, the data system UID errors, which is a bit unexpected because it only logs UID changes for a given package or signature changes. Should not happen very often, but quite interesting. Uh, okay, so we found out in the settings application, as shown there, that you can actually browse the permission system-wide. You can ask the system to display the list of all the permissions it knows, and then get per permission the list of applications impacted. We also found out that we could get the permission list for a single ap uh, application, but that would be the regular app details uh, activity. And um, using this uh, configure app menu that you can show a few seconds in this GIF, at some point it shows two lines referring to the right secure systems and the ability to draw over other applications. Those two features are backed with permissions too, but those permissions get a particular flag, the app up flags. 
meaning it is runtime, though you can't really grant this permission using the regular prompt, prompted UI uh, grant permissions. You just need, you are forced as an application developer to bring your user to the setting application, which is the only one that has enough privileges to grant that one. Uh, another little thing that actually all of us already know, but I was quite surprised to see it applied to permissions, is the naming convention. You need to get a point or a kinda package name naming, uh, because the three first options declaring a permission groups are totally valid. The system is just going to prefix the two first with the current package. But it is going to register this permission group as a full name. So when referencing it, you need to use the full name, even though you used the sh uh, syntax shortcut earlier for defining the group. A permission needs to reference a full package name permission group. So what we saw now that Google provides the, the means to uh, users and developers to make them more sensible to security matters. But also, the way it's done, it not, um, implies user fatigue, you know, to be prone every time for each dangerous permission. That's why it relies on group. And the other thing is, the cool way of this is that the user is able to ch have the choice to allow or not to a, for, a, for, a giving, uh, for a giving group. And um, so now you need, as developers, to justify the need of a permission. So thank you for your attention, and do you have any questions? Okay. Questions, raise your hand. I have one oh. then. Tell me. So what's going to change with Marshmallow? Um, and, you know, the, the whole new thing about the permissions? What's going to change is the way you're going to dev your apps. You need to, uh, as a developer, to give the mean to your user to understand why you're doing things and what is going to add the feature to your application. Do not respecting the dangerous permission as this, and this prompting thing is a very bad idea. And I think that Google do understand that we are in a, a very big world where security matters really start to be very important. And you have to uh, follow Google's um, um, proposal with the runtime permission. One more question. Uh, you mentioned that there's an, like an unknown territory for apps that are developed for pre-23 API level, which are actually now deployed on Marshmallow for the dangerous uh, permissions. Sure. So what's the situation there? Do you have any insights there? Well, I don't have that much insight, but the, the idea is that uh, the permissions are revocable and the application obviously does not expect its permission to get denied because it usually doesn't get installed in its regular use case. So the framework is supposed to fake some results and uh, I've seen code in, uh, specifically in the mount service saying that uh, either you can read nothing or the device is not even mounted, something like that, but it is going to be a per use case, a specific response from the framework depending on the feature you are requesting because you can't really fake uh, behavior or no feature the same way. So basically we can even expect app crashes or the system will gonna f catch the, 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 the problem and just deny everything. We, we, we don't know what's going to happen, basically. It's if you don't, it, that's, difficult that's, to answer. Yeah. Because yeah. our is app there, is, is not handling the, the revoked permission, yeah. and system is probably going to try to catch exception or something and just keep maybe killing activity. But basically, we don't know. We need to support it. So, so yes, well. need, yes, that's true. You need to support that, to, to support the permission you know. Okay. You must, uh, you yep. must. On SDK 22 or earlier to 23, the idea is you won't get security exception. The system will try to answer something like, I'm empty, I can't answer you. It's not a security exception, but I can't do the job. Okay, thanks. No problem.
Hi. Uh, is there a way to list in my code all the piece of code where I need a permission? You know, uh, just run lint or something like that and it tell me here you need to handle permission for uh, writing a file. Here you need permission for such a stuff. For me to catch this moment. Is there a, a way to list all the piece of code I have in my application where I am need to manage permission. Uh, you mean when you when you are writing the app for the first time? Um, I kind of think that Android. I think Android Studio does this. No. Yeah, it does. You, you basically need to set an annotation for for a method that requires a certain permission, and then the system will try will uh, display the message. To prompt the user, do you this method, this operation requires this permission? Do you allow it or, or deny? It? So basically, you're just annotating methods that require certain permissions with the permission that that they require, and that's that's the way you communicate with the system that then handles the the uh, acceptance of, of of the permission or, or or denial. Well, at some point when you're using an API, you get to the developer uh, documentation, so you should know actually from the start which permission is going to get needed. But uh, we have a lot of tools in Android Studio that helps us with that. Ah, okay. Can you repeat to the micro, please? Sure. Um, okay, so the question is, where do, how do you make an evolution to an old application Basically, a big old application that uses several permission when tran making the transition to the API level 23. Well, I guess you can. I don't have an answer regarding tools you can use to do this, but you should know which of your API depend on which feature and then on which permission. And you. Find usage. Uh, you have to find um, a way to implement the permission request in an asynchronous way as it is suggested in the documentation and support the fact that you might not get this permission and possibly create a new behavior or a new activity saying that I can't work, I really need that or something totally different. I can work out but I, I won't be able to do this and this. There is no easy way, I guess, to do this. You just have to do it piece by piece. Or may just try to you know, use a fine usage uh, um, um, tools when you're clicking, right-clicking on the on the string in your in your uh, maybe in your manifest, we'll be able to find out. I hope so. Anyway, for your big application. <laughs> hey, uh, do you know if anything uh, if there's anything regarding you know updating uh, your app on the Play Store when you request a dangerous level permission? Does the app gets auto-updated or does it require manual update? Uh, if I recall correctly, the behavior on update is if it was installed and if it had the dangerous permission, it will get auto-granted. Okay. But the system definitely knows when it's making an update and has specific <coughs> error. If you're interested in, in that, there is a very funny stuff happening in the system is when you have a new, um, a new Android version coming, and for example, in the new Android version, you have a new, defin new defined uh, permission, and that your permi permission do need the uh, use of this permission, but you don't update your application. When you install the IPK, you just put the permission for you in the manifest, and it is, is, is grant at this moment. That's fun. Yeah, one question in the front. At the front. Do you think of any use case uh, for permission groups? Uh, in, what benefit for for developer? Well, for the the developer really, it doesn't imply that much. It's much more of the relationship that developer and users get to security matters, because the permission group in here is only a tool for UX, for UX actually, for a way to present the, the permission to the user, not getting too specific. Um, 
So it would be useful if you define a set of applications that work together, I guess, and that needs specific permissions to work out different components. It's used, uh, it would be used in, our, I guess, ROM customization for specific service for customers, but uh, it's, it would make sense in quite a big system because permissions are used to uh, access features. So you kind of need at least a part that defines the features, that provides the feature, and another part that would con con use this feature, consume, consume this feature. So it can be used, but uh, well, it will be used, sure. But uh, for a set, it makes sense for a set of applications, really, a set of services. Want to just add something about that? I know if you saw in the in later GIF, when you have a dangerous permission that a custom one that don't belong to a group, you will see uh, when you had the global uh, permission um, groups um, display in your settings, you will at the bottom you will see additional permission. So if you declare a custom permission at dangerous level, you will find your your permission there. So using groups will help your user to understand. So that's why I think the only we need. Well, uh, I was thinking just if you define a service that has a read and write permission regarding sensitive information, you might want to group them and set them as dangerous. And I was thinking just now about a library. Yeah. In right. Using a library. Yeah, that would be interesting too because you could. Uh, Define a whole group as it is. Mm, sure. Thank you. Thank you.